Okay, um, good morning everyone. It's so nice to be here and I thank the Wilson Center, Duncan Wood and Eric Olson for the uh, invitation to moderate today's panel. It's been uh, really busy on Capitol Hill for the last two weeks with a lot of questions about um, how has this, you know, security cooperation that we've been doing for a decade with Mexico benefited, benefited the U.S. and what can we do to continue it? And, um, and you've already discussed in the first panel a lot of those things and I'm so excited to hear more from our experts in this panel. And one, one thing that, that people don't realize is how, how intertwined the security issues are between our two countries, whether it's, you know, the debate over U.S. demand causing uh, the opium to be grown more in Mexico and then Mexico eradicating more and, and how how actually that's accelerated a lot recently. The extraditions, which have been uh, almost 270 under um, Peña Nieto, and I just got the number for last year. It was actually 79 last year, but um, but it's it's good. And and the military to military cooperation, the counter terror cooperation has ex has advanced a lot since 9/11. Um, and you know the the interdiction of of immig immigrants. At, at there was 16,000 people from Africa. Um, apprehended in Mexico last year, almost 5,000 from Asia, almost 5,000 Haitians, in addition to more than 150,000 Central Americans in 2015 and 2016. So, you know, Im immigration enforcement uh, sometimes happens away from the southwest border, and, and, and that's sort of, you know, a benefit, if you would say. And then, on the other hand, Mexico had gotten a lot of criticism for not offering asylum to people, and that actually tripled last year. So, the Mexican government's been trying to, you know, help um, on those issues. So, I'm so excited to hear about, I mean, it's been disconcerting to see also at the same time that um, last year that the violence in, had increased in 2015, but it didn't seem quite so much as this past year. So, um, and in border cities have been affected um, from what I've read. So I'm really excited that we have this great panel today. Um, we're going to start with sort of an overall look. Um, David Shirk has been um, writing on these issues for longer than I have. He's at um, the University of San Diego. And every year they put out a wonderful um, reflection on, on the the, the organized crime related violence in Mexico and so he'll talk about sort of a national perspective and then Octavio Rodriguez who's uh, the, the program director of justice in Mexico uh, is that correct yes I'm trying to do everyone's bios from memory rather than um, we'll talk about we'll drill down a little bit more and focus um, on the area of Tijuana because he's in San Diego and they've seen the violence in Tijuana is actually very alarming and so it, it'll be interesting to see also Alfredo Corchado who's a correspondent for the Dallas Morning News how two cities that were considered success stories because of a lot of effort on both the law enforcement and um, you know prevention and all all sides seeing a rise in violence and why is that happening and how can it be um, that we get back on a trajectory that's that's better in terms of lessen the violence so I'm excited to hear from both of them and um, then we're going to hear from Dr. Guadalupe Corre Correa Cabrera who's a fellow here right now at the Wilson Center and she uh, is amazing and has written on one of the most one of the most dangerous parts of, of, of the border, and I've, I've never ventured, and I don't know that I will, but I read her, her information on, uh, on Tamaulipas, the state that um, I've been meeting with a lot of the representatives from that part of um, the Texas-Mexico border who haven't gone over to the other side in five to seven years because they just don't want to risk it and stuff, and they have family there, so I'm really excited to hear from you. And then Chris Kyle, who covers one, one of the most violent parts of Mexico, he's been covering it for decades, from a broader perspective in economic development, and um, an understanding of Guerrero State and the area where now um, opium is being grown, but also it's much more complex than that in terms of what's driving the violence in Guerrero. So um, without further ado, I'd like to start with David. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, obviously, I want to thank uh, Eric and uh, Duncan, uh, uh, Andrea, uh, who organized this, uh, this seminar, and uh, the Wilson Center. Uh, people of the world, um, I'm going to go go through basically uh, the as uh, as Claire said the sort of national overview of what's going on in terms of uh, violence in Mexico uh, issues, and then uh, sort of open up some of the discussion that we'll see later on uh, the regional case studies. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about causal factors, what we think is going on, and and how we might respond as well. Uh, I'm going to make ten points about the character of the violence that we've seen in Mexico over, at this point, roughly a decade of uh, elevated levels of, of homicide. Uh, the first point is that uh, as bad as things seem and as uh, many points as I'm going to make about 
the um, increases in violence uh, that we've seen in the last year or two. If you look on a per capita basis, Mexico looks uh, quite normal, if you will, uh, for <coughs> Latin America. Uh, the homicide rate in Mexico uh, is still uh, way below what we're seeing in certain Central American uh, countries uh, and, and other trouble spots in the region, uh, even Brazil. Uh, and so there are lots of places uh, around the region where you can look at uh, the, uh, the problem of crime and violence and see that uh, comparatively uh, it could be much worse for Mexico. Um, that said, the second point is that because we're talking about per capita, because Mexico is a fairly large country, the second largest country in the region, the absolute toll of violence, uh, even uh, at a modest or moderate homicide rate, we're talking around 20 per 100,000, uh, is quite a huge impact in terms of the number of people who are affected uh, by this violence. Uh, and uh, you can see that the biggest increases that we've seen in the last few years, this is only up till 2012, uh, but in the last few years, the biggest increases that we've seen uh, have been in Mexico. So the, the uh, part of the reason that we're especially concerned about Mexico is the, uh, the massive toll in terms of loss of life. Uh, when you look at, uh, the third point is that when you look at uh, the trajectory of violence in Mexico over the last few years, uh, the, the direction of, of violence uh, shifted very suddenly. Uh, s starting in 2008. 2007 was actually the lowest recorded uh, number of homicides in Mexican history. Uh, many people blame or uh, date Mexico's drug war back to 2006, and, and certainly the uh, incoming administration of Felipe Calderon made counter drug efforts a priority uh, from the very beginning of uh, it, the administration in December 2006. But uh, we didn't see a large increase in homicides unt until uh, around 2008 or over the course of 2007 and 2008. The, of the roughly 200 or so homicides that have occurred in that decade-long period from 2006 to the present um, or till uh, the end of 2016, what we've uh, also been able to observe is that through various media outlets uh, and independent tracking uh, efforts, uh, monitoring efforts of this violence, uh, actually looking at the individual uh, homicides and what kinds of weaponry has been used, how many victims have been uh, or perpetrators have been involved, uh, we see that there is a definite pattern in which uh, much of the increase in violence since 2008 is attributable to organized crime. In fact, al almost all of the, the massive increase uh, it involves uh, very high-powered weaponry. We're talking about AK-47s, high-caliber weapons, uh, rapid-fire weapons. Uh, also, uh, in many cases, uh, messaging narco mensajes uh, that identify uh, some group or another. Um, so we, we see that organized crime is, in fact, uh, a major contributor to the violence that we've seen in the last uh, roughly 10 years. Uh, if you, the, the fourth po fifth point here is that if you uh, break down the violence in terms of uh, the timeline of just the last uh, two presidential administrations, you can see that there was a consistent rise over time from uh, December 2006 uh, 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 up until the end of the Calderon administration, roughly. The trajectory of violence was w uh, positive uh, and uh, strong. Uh, now, you'll notice that there are really significant spikes and declines in violence at different points in time, uh, and that's, uh, that's important to observe, and I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. Uh, but what was interesting over the last few years, during the Peña Nieto administration, there was sort of a two or three year period in which we saw st uh, a steady decline. Peña Nieto uh, appear came into office promising that within the first six months uh, we would see significant declines in violence during the campaign, 
campaign, he said there would be a 50 percent drop in violence. Uh, that was uh, extremely ambitious. Uh, but we did see a significant year-over-year uh, -year decrease uh, f uh, over the course of 2013 and 2014. And then, uh, starting in 2015 and 2016, the numbers started to creep back up. And I know you're saying why, but we're not at the why portion of the presentation, so just hang on. We're at the, we're at the what pres, uh, portion. Uh, the other thing that we uh, should really take uh, stock of at this point uh, is last year had uh, a uh, very significant spike in, in violence uh, mid-year, starting from around May to, to August, uh, and then uh, sort of cooled off towards the end of the year. <coughs> so uh, the sharpest increases in, um, I in 2016 uh, were really these two peaks in May and July. My sixth point, seventh point, my tenth, seventh commandment here is uh, that another aspect of the violence we have to keep in mind is that it is highly, uh, it is not randomly distributed. It is highly concentrated in certain parts of the country, um, uh, particularly in the north uh, west uh, during the worst of the violence, uh, the Gulf Coast, um, uh, and uh, to some extent uh, the, uh, the eastern border region, the regions that we're going to be talking about uh, uh, later in, in the presentations in this panel. Uh, in 2016, um, the violence, again, was, was uh, highly concentrated, and uh, the top 15 cities, or sorry, the top five cities uh, with the most violence in Mexico accounted for 15 percent of all homicides uh, over the course of the last year, which uh, sounds like a lot, but during the peak of the violence in 2011, the top five cities accounted for about a third of all homicides in Mexico. So if you saw a big drop in Ciudad Juarez, it had a national level effect. Uh, now uh, violence is significantly more dispersed to, uh, to, to uh, various municipalities, so it makes it uh, a more complicated uh, or widespread problem that we need to address. Uh, and within those specific geographic regions, it's important to take note of the clusters that were most violent. Uh, there's a slight change here in the increments we used in our map so that we can really highlight uh, those cases where we're really seeing hundreds of homicides um, uh, concentrated in just a couple of municipalities. Maybe 30 or 40 municipalities account uh, for uh, the highest levels of violence uh, in Mexico and, and uh, should really be target areas. The final point that I'd like to make is the, the, the problem uh, that is m perhaps most disturbing about uh, the trend in crime and violence in Mexico, which is uh, the extraordinary difficulty that uh, authorities have had in ensuring that uh, the perpetrators of this violence are brought to justice. Uh, the vast majority of the 200 plus thousand homicides that have occurred over the last decade have not been solved. Um, and the individuals who have perpetrated this violence continue to do so unless they themselves become victims. Uh, so uh, the, the problems that, uh, that Eric uh, uh, pointed out in, uh, with regard to the criminal justice system, the need for uh, strengthening the institutional integrity of Mexico's justice sector uh, could not be understated. I want to talk about two sort of perspectives on why this is happening now. Well, one perspective um, sort of highlights the fact that these are, um, that, that many of the uh, homicides that take place are concentrated in very specific neighborhoods. Um, and there are certain social dynamics and, and economic factors that are highly correlated with uh, this violence. And that is absolutely true. Uh, there, if, if we're looking at long term preventative uh, uh, solutions uh, addressing the educational and, and um, uh, employment deficits that Mexico has uh, and, and uh, pay scale and so forth. Those kinds of things would have a huge effect in uh, helping to address uh, the violence. But they cannot explain this. Uh, the variation in the timing uh, in the peaks and valleys of violence. Uh, if, uh, if socioeconomic factors are the fuel of this violence uh, than the specific dynamics of uh, 
what's going on in the underworld of organized crime and, and uh, whether or not certain individuals have been captured or killed has a very uh, highly significant effect in driving the violence up or down, uh, at least on a large scale uh, at the national level. It determines what groups are moving into what territories uh, and therefore what kinds of clashes you're going to see on the ground. And I'll just point out, you know, what was interesting over the course of the Calderon administration was this uh, full-on uh, battle royale between the major organized crime groups uh, of Mexico in just a handful of cities, as I mentioned. Uh, but then after some of the major leaders of contending organizations were effectively removed from that conflict, like Benham, the extradition of Benjamin Ariano Felix to the United States, uh, where he could no longer orchestrate the war from behind uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the bars of a Mexican prison, we start to see violence coming down. Uh, and I like to think of this as the phase in which the Sinaloa cartel becomes the uh, consolidated power uh, in the organized crime world, uh, particularly by the time uh, Miguel Trevino gets arrested. And then you have this nice Pax Sinaloa, uh, during which violence is at uh, a relatively lower level uh, and, and dips to its lowest point. Uh, we see the removal of the Knights Templar, uh, the, the eradication practically of the La Familia organization. But then we captured Chapo again. And then uh, we extradited him. And over, well, uh, so over the course of the last uh, six uh, to 12 months, this seems to be related to or correlated to uh, the, the rising effect that we've seen. So um, uh, what we now have, when we look at those highly uh, uh, violent clusters, we have a better sense of the, the sort of new divisions and new uh, uh, clashes that are going on to help drive some of this violence in 2016. Uh, so very quickly, I'm, I've been told I have one minute left. Uh, I'm just going to say, uh, you can't do one or the other. You obviously have to uh, address the long-term socioeconomic problems that, that uh, are widespread in Mexico and so many other countries in the region. But you also have to pay, pay close attention to what's going on in terms of the, uh, our efforts uh, in combating uh, organized crime and how the, the, there can be unintended consequences uh, to the progress that we make in, that, in those counter-drug efforts. So uh, on the one hand, um, you're not going to solve chronic societal problems overnight, so what can you do? Um, you can certainly focus on those particular zones uh, that are affected uh, worst by socioeconomic problems and direct targeted uh, aid programs to uh, violence prevention, uh, uh, gang uh, mediation efforts in those areas. The other thing that you can do in terms of uh, addressing organized crime is really think carefully about what is your counter drug strategy um, uh, and what are the ways that you can reduce the, uh, the competition between criminal organizations, either by removing the profit, uh, legalization is one thing that people have pointed to, um, or by in some, some other, or, or not using drugs, we can just all quit. Uh, using drugs uh, or legalized, or uh, reduce impunity in some significant way. You've got to arrest the people that are actually committing the crime so that they don't kill more people. Um, and uh, lastly, um, you can either uh, target certain groups that appear to be conducting the worst kind of violence uh, and tolerate those that, that do uh, less violence because uh, if I don't like that strategy because you're basically turning a blind eye to criminal activity, but uh, certainly there are good reasons to prioritize uh, organizations that are, uh, that are highly violent criminal organizations. So thank you very much. Thanks for your patience, Claire. <laughs>
So I'm going to try to make sense of some of those changes uh, in my presentation. And I'm going to start just to put you in context of how Tijuana looked like for the last 20 years, let's say. And as you can see in this slide, uh, homicide rates in Tijuana, and this is not rates but absolute numbers of homicides, but they were relatively uh, stable over, uh, let's say, 17 years starting in 1990. Uh, something happened uh, on around 2007, 2008, where homicides increased dramatically, as you can see in this slide, uh, to unprecedented levels. Uh, it's the same phenomenon that we see at the national level. And as David said, uh, <coughs> we're going to talk about the whys later, but uh, uh, just wanted to, to start with some of, this, uh, some of the content. Um, when you um, cross-reference uh, various sources of information, uh, you can see that actually uh, moving forward after the huge spike in, in violence and homicides in 2010, uh, things uh, started to, to st uh, get stable again, as we can see for uh, the years 2011, 2014, seems to be uh, pretty, uh, I wouldn't say normal, but at least stable in terms of homicides. And something happened by 2015 and 2016 again. Uh, over the last two years, we've seen uh, a huge increase in homicides. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's, and it's um, causing people to you know, ask why Tijuana was supposed to be a success story as it was uh, Ciudad Juarez, and uh, Alfredo is going to talk about that later. But what happened in, two in 2015, 2016, uh, I'm sorry, it says 2060, but it, sh uh, it should be 2016. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that good. <laughs> but we can see that uh, over the last year, uh, homicides was pretty stable, in but going up. Uh, uh, homicides kept the trend uh, upwards uh, until the most violent month of uh, the year that was December. And, you know, by the end of last year, people started to, to really think about the problem uh, in a more serious way. Uh, it, it, it's, about, it's time to really think about what's being done and what uh, effects uh, policies have had uh, over over the years, I mean, this is just a it's a complicated slide. Don't even try to make sense of it. But it shows homicide levels for the last uh, four uh, five years uh, in a monthly basis. Um, one other thing that uh, started to uh, you know raise red flags in, in in Tijuana for the last year was uh, the increasing in femicides. Uh, increasing numbers of homicides against women or gender-based homicides. Uh, and it, trying to make sense of, uh, of that phenomenon, I, I, I started to look into numbers of homicides of, of, uh, of women. And as we can see, uh, homicides of, of women have followed the, sem the same trend. Uh, although, they are still very uh, low in comparison to uh, male homicides, but still, it's a growing uh, it's a growing problem, especially because it's targeting uh, middle class uh, and higher class uh, families. And uh, again, it's sad, but uh, whenever middle class and higher class started to be targeted is when people start to pay attention to it. Um, so uh, it's, just a, it's just a growing concern. At the same time, though, we've seen, uh, again, along with increasing in homicides, we see a decrease in other, other types of crime. Uh, this graph, it's just accumulated other crimes like, like extortion, kidnapping, robberies, uh, both um, violent and nonviolent robbery. 
So we start to, to ask why, as, as David mentioned, socioeconomic uh, factors really affect and really uh, fuel violence, but uh, the, the question is, what is that is triggering violence? Uh, again, here we can see that uh, trends of other crimes tend to decrease. Uh, well, you know, we see violent robbery is the top one uh, with, uh, you know, varying uh, trend, but in general, both of, uh, most of them tend to, to decrease over, over time while homicide is increasing. Now it's the whys. Uh, by the year 2008, 2009, uh, things started to change at the national level. And if you remember uh, David's slide on uh, what, you know, at the time, some of the violence started to, to calm down uh, in, the, in the country as a whole was by the time Benjamin Arellano Felix was extradited to the United States. Although that was the, the time where violence spiked in, in, in Tijuana. And the reason why, I mean, theories and there are a lot of experts that have argued the case that uh, at some point during that time, a uh, huge split during, uh, within the Tijuana cartel or the Ariana Felix organization uh, caused an internal intestinal fight uh, between El Ingeniero, which is Fernando Sanchez Arellano, and Teodoro Garcia Cimental, El Teo, uh, a top lieutenant of the organization. Um, that allegedly, uh, late after, allied with uh, Sinaloa to fight uh, the Tijuana cartel. The response to that uh, spike of violence was uh, a somehow militarized approach. Uh, the local government of Tijuana appointed the notorious and famous uh, lieutenant from, from the army, uh, Le Leisaola. And during the time of Leisaola, we've seen a decrease in homicides, but also an increase in alleged violations of human rights. Um, at the same time, though, uh, it was a time where police suffered one of the major purges in, in its history. And that was perceived within uh, the Tijuana Police Department, both as scaring but also promising. Uh, just in 2005, we conducted a huge survey of the Tijuana Police Department, and we had the, the opportunity to talk to, to officers and to really get the sense of what they feel and what they think. And they did say that it was a, it was a very scary moment because you, you knew that probably uh, some of them were going to be affected, even though they were, uh, or they alleged to be innocent, uh, because this uh, purge conducted by, by uh, Police Chief Leisaola did affect some people that weren't uh, supposed to be affected. However, one of the things they mentioned, it did work really well, is that they perceive uh, Leisaola as one of them, and that's, that's how they say. Uh, he uh, improved communication and cohesion within the force, and that's one of, and, and of course, a lot of modernization. They acquire new equipment, cars, uniforms, etc. So, in a way, it was uh, perceived as the most positive reform uh, within the police in you know the last 20 years. But what's happening now? Uh, what's happening now is uh, somehow different. I just want to go to uh, to what I was I was saying, and the first spike in violence. Uh, coincided with the extradition of uh, Benjamin Arellano Felix and the uh, split of within the, the Arellano Felix organization. Uh, and then during the time of Leisaola, we see uh, you know, stabilization of, of the situation. And then again, by, uh, 90, uh, by the end of 2009, we see another increase in violence uh, where uh, it is alleged that finally Sinaloa uh, managed to negotiate a truce with uh, the Ariano Felix organization, leaving uh, El Ingeniero, the former leader of, of the Tijuana cartel, in charge of the region, but also with uh, influence of the Tijuana cartel in, in, in trafficking routes. Um, 
as we can see, many uh, local authorities and the, the police chiefs have had uh, different uh, challenges to, uh, to deal with, as, as we can see. Uh, the I'm going to show it here. Le Le Saola had to uh, face the one of the most violent uh, times in, in in modern history in Tijuana. Well, actually, uh, the first uh, the police chief after Le Saola Capella had to resign because of that increase in violence. And as we can see, that huge spike that occurred by November 2008 uh, caused. Uh, Chief Capella, his position. And then uh, we see Leisaola coming and directly targeting uh, trafficking groups in, in, in the region of Tijuana, directly targeting uh, alleged corrupt police, but also at the same time improving, improving police force uh, in Tijuana. Uh, after Leisaola, things have been uh, different. Things, look, uh, things looked a little better. Uh, Again, Operativo Tijuana, the federal uh, response to increasing organized crime activity in the region, uh, was uh, told also as a success story along with uh, local um, initiatives to, to tamper violence. Uh, and, and then again, for three, four years, uh, Tijuana started to see a rise in community uh, engagement, uh, businesses, you know, if uh, if you have ever had a chance to go to, to the region, I mean, the wine country uh, just south of Tijuana is amazing, amazing restaurants. And over the f last five years, uh, I would say three, four years, uh, people started to go south. People from California started to go south again uh, to just to encounter a different Tijuana, a much modern, sophisticated city. Uh, that was probably the golden times for, uh, for the municipality. However, for the last two years, things have started to, uh, to see different. Uh, the reason why, uh, well, after the capture of uh, El Chapo, it is alleged that uh, the Ariano Felix organization is trying to regain certain some control over the, the, the city while other groups are trying to, uh, to be players in the field, such as the uh, Jalisco Nueva Generacion Cartel who, as we see, is, the, uh, is, is the, the, the cartel, the criminal organization that is expanding uh, more and more in Mexico uh, in um, you know, trying to, to, to uh, control routes and territories that were uh, part of the SEDES organization at some point that they were uh, controlled by uh, the Knights Templar in Michoacan and central Mexico and now uh, territories controlled by the Sinaloa cartel. So uh, solutions, possible solutions to the problem. Um, as we can see, and uh, as David mentioned, there is two level, uh, uh, th there's a two level solution. First of all, uh, target uh, criminal organizations. And that's not something local authorities in Tijuana can do. I mean, drug trafficking is a federal crime. That's, uh, that's up to federal authorities to, uh, to solve. However, and, um, sorry, however, at the local level, there are, there are some things we can do. And as, as happened uh, during the time of Leisa Ola, we, we, we think that it, uh, something similar is happening right now. Uh, current efforts are to try to modernize police again to try to uh, Im improve communication within the police uh, and try to get better cohesion and of course, and as always, uh, try to fight corruption among uh, police officers. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. Um, first of all, I wanna thank uh, also Eric and Eloso and uh, <laughs> Duncan, Chris, and Andrea for the, uh, for the invitation and, and organizing this panel. And I want to apologize that I, do, I don't have a uh, PowerPoint. Um, I'm a reporter, and I think that's why we're in serious, serious trouble. Cause I'm <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm just going to um, read a few comments, and then uh, Claire may ask some questions, or, or we can wait for the Q&A. Um, and my, my area is, is Ciudad Juarez. Um, I, 
I spent a lot of years in Juarez, both as a, as a resident, as a child, and also as a reporter over, over the last uh, 25, 30 years. Um, 2016 was a really bad year for Juarez, and it wasn't just the fact that Juan Gabriel died. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I want to put it in perspective. I mean, um, Juarez is, uh, is nothing like the period between 2000. 2011, when more than 10,000 people were killed. Uh, as many of you know, quite has earned the reputation as the murder capital of the world. The homicides were off the chart. And let me try to put it in perspective. As, as David was saying earlier, um, in 2007, uh, Juarez recorded one of the lowest um, homicides for that year. It had 320 killings, uh, which was high enough. New York, with a population of 8 million people, counted 494 murders that year. But in 2008, as the cartel wars raged, homicides in Juarez jumped to 1,623. In 2009, the figure reached 2,754, uh, as well as uh, a wave of um, crime, petty crime, and extortions, kidnappings, robberies, convenience stores. In 2010, the deaths climbed to a staggering 3,622, or an average of 10 people killed per day. The surge in killings was so bad, <clears throat> I remember covering uh, this, this story. Uh, I would find the mayor oftentimes uh, spending part of the day praying for a miracle. The military was brought in, a move that many human rights activists to this day say made the violence even worse. I remember walking the streets of Ciudad Juarez and, and wondering whether the city of my childhood was dying. Our favorite bars and restaurants had been shuttered. Many uh, establishments closed down rather than, than risk the consequences of not paying protection. Cartels torched businesses that failed to pay, leaving them in, in cinders. Whole sections of Juarez fell abandoned, gone. Many owners uh, simply fled with their families and set up shop on, in El Paso where they waited for peace to return. The impact had consequences on both sides of the border, with at least 30,000 people from Juarez, according to the El Paso police chief, fleeing into El Paso alone. For the first time that I remember, El Paso finally had a nightlife, as dozens of businesses moved north of the border. Even schools from Mexico opened in El Paso to meet the demand of the children of the elite who had moved to El Paso's west side. And yet, there was a silver lining. Many of those who stayed behind decided to build community, oftentimes with the blood of their children. The best example of this was the 2010 massacre of teenagers and young adults at a party in Villa de Salvarcar, one of the working class barrios in the, in the sprawling side of, of the border city. In total, more than 35 people were shot, 15 of them died. The tragedy marked a turning point in Juarez, and I would say the country. It stunned all of Mexico with a trauma as soul-shaking as the inflicted in the United States by the 2012 mass shootings of first graders at a school in Newton, Connecticut. The killing of Villa Salvarca seemed to compress in a few seconds all the, frost, the false premise, mayhem, malice, madness that rampaged through the streets. The killings in Villa Salvarca began with members of the Barrio Azteca gang arrived in two vehicles and still left both ends of the street lined with tiny houses. They began firing, believing that their victims were members of the hated rival gang, Artistas Asesinos, the murder artists sometimes known as the, the, the AA. It was a horrendous case of mistaken identity. The victims had nothing to do with gangs. Some of them were members of a team celebrating a, a teammate's birthday and their tournament victory in the AA League of American Football. Amid the tragedy, the team, the community, and the city of Juarez came together, united by a desire to not just improve their community, but seek justice. <clears throat> and I just lost my thing. <laughs> um, ¿Qué hago? To, to seek justice, improvise, she says. <laughs> <clears throat> Many residents, government officials, and civil society groups, with the backing of the U.S. government and funds from the Media Initiative, 
banded together in response. They rolled out new policies that helped reduce security. Many credit the alleged victory of the Sinaloa cartel for the moment as, keeping, as key in helping bring down the, the, the killings. With the help of new legal reforms, some of the accused were convicted, although questions remain as, as they do often in Mexico as to whether there was a rush to justice. Parents came, to, parents came together and sports programs to try to keep the teens from praying arms of the cartels. They organized after school sports leagues with students, parents walking neighborhoods to talk to kids. They worked with security citizen groups that also brought in police, uh, policemen, policewomen, as they sat down on weekends to try to build trust. They even had secret meetings inside the U.S. Consulate Office with counterparts from Tamaulipas as both sides tried to learn from one another. Things were marching well. The police, the mayor, the community were, were quick to declare victory as if it was a new morning in Ciudad Juarez. And at, fir and at first glance it was, killings fell dramatically from more than 3,500 3, people to a few hundred. Restaurants reopened, people from El Paso, some people from El Paso went back. Interviews with shopkeepers, cab drivers, regular citizens suggested that extortions had either dropped or in some cases gone away, which was a milestone achievement because at one point the criminals had become so blatant and emboldened that they would give businesses a bank account number so they could do direct deposit and save them from from, uh, from the time from, of making weekly visits. Journalists on both sides of the border, including me, were quick to write the story of the remarkable Juarez comeback. In retrospect, as you talk to people today, they will say, que bonito caballo verde. <clears throat> In other words, they were too quick to declare victory. The year two, 2016 marked the worst year in homicides in Ciudad Juarez. The level of brutality and style of killings are reminiscent of, of that that was seen between 2008 and 2012, between the Juarez and Sinaloa cartel. Except this time you have a new player in the unfolding drama, Jalisco Nueva Generación. Nueva Generación and La Línea, AKA the Juarez cartel, have formed an alliance to finish up a deeply fragmented Sinaloa cartel and take control of one of the most lucrative routes, the Juarez El Paso distribution route that supplies chains all over the United States, particularly the Southwest, where meth is, is uh, ep epidemic is high. <clears throat> Behind the war, and, and this is, uh, you hear this a lot uh, from, um, from people in both Ciudad Juarez and, in, and on the U.S. side, you hear whispers that, um, that the alliance is really between Rafael Caro Quintero and the offsprings of the Carrillo Fuentes family. Uh, both sides have come together to push aside uh, killed an, uh, a former ally, the, the Splinter Sinaloa cartel. But like many stories, like many theories, this one's hard to prove. And when, when you talk to officials on both sides of the border, they, they remain split. What is interesting is how the uh, Juarez and, uh, and the Gener Nueva Generación have like a campaign in, in the city where they say we're trying to um, finish out the Sinaloa cartel to try to keep the meth off the streets because the meth is so destructive. Um, Recently, uh, two human heads were found left in, in a Juarez neighborhood inside coolers in Colonia Nuevo Hipódromo, along with a narco mensaje. The bodies were found later. The mensaje was, this is a warning to anyone who sells crystal meth. To put the numbers in perspective, <coughs> um, now, I'll, I'll give you a sense of, uh, of how the homicides uh, gone up from uh, January to the present. Uh, January of last year started with 37, uh, <clears throat> February is 24, and then you begin to see a spike in August, um, 57, in September, 60. In October uh, of last year, it was 105. November went down to 33. December went to 56. Um, October, people say, was particularly bloody because that was the, uh, the time of a change of, of, of government. For the first time since 1992, you had an um, opposition government, uh, Javier Corral uh, of the PAN, who took over um, Chihuahua. The whereabouts of the, of the former governor, Cesar Duarte, remain unknown amid allegations of widespread corruption.
Juarez also integrate, uh, inaugurated the first independent mayor, Armando Cavada Alvidres, assumed the office of mayor um, in, in also in early October. He's the first independent candidate to uh, govern Juarez in history. <clears throat> One of the things that you're seeing also lately, as I was talking about it, you know, we, we were talking about extortions earlier, how they're, they were using bank accounts. Um, I was in Juarez a couple of weeks ago and talking to people on the streets, and they're saying uh, ever since the election of Donald Trump, <clears throat> the uh, criminals are back on the streets extorting people, but this time they're not taking pesos because the uh, peso keeps fluctuating so much, they, they're demanding dollars. Um, and it's anywhere from um, 6 to $10 uh, from a cab driver to a taco vendor or even customers looking for spare parts at a local uh, junkyard. Um, <clears throat> I, I was just reading this last night. Um, the, the first uh, numbers that came out from Reforma newspaper, and uh, David is here, I'm, she's, he's going to have to bet it, bet it later and, and tell me if I'm right or wrong, or if Reforma is right or wrong. But for the month of uh, January, a total of 832 people were killed, uh, compared to the average of 540. That means that there's 26.8 people kill, killed per month um, in, in some other cities. Of the 832 killed, 779 were women, 52 are men. The state of Chihuahua registered 90, just below Guerrero at 125. Colima is third with 52, and Tijuana fourth with 49. Juarez recorded 50, 54 homicides which continues to worry uh, local residents and local authorities who have formed security councils. They, again, attribute this to, to the, um, the splintering of the, um, the Sinaloa and the rise of crystal meth, not just in Juarez, uh, but in the U.S. domestic market. There are two things that um, seem to have people very worried as, uh, as we enter 2017. Um, one is uh, Trump's... Um, what people call vitrolic, like, uh, oftentimes poisonous talk about building the wall and making Mexicans pay for it. Um, uh, the, the talk of mass deportations, a 20% tax import, disrupting trade, and most recently taking a swipe at the Mexican military. Um, civil society has long seen the U.S. as supporters, standing behind them, providing them uh, know-how on judicial reform. They say more work needs to be done to strengthen institutions, rule of law, continuity in police departments. Um, every two years, every three years, every six years, there's always complete turnovers, and they feel like the, there's a need for continuity. They don't understand, they, don't, they, they question whether this will continue or the, or the financial support will continue on, under Trump, or whether there's um, a break in trade um, and the, 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 the impact, the devastation that could have on, on the Juarez economy. Um, one thing that the uh, Villa Salvarca people were telling me recently was that they find that it's harder and harder to recruit people to, to play sports in, in the last few weeks, that more and more people are turning to, uh, again, to drug cartels, uh, and, and this has them deeply worried. When you talk to U.S. officials on both sides, and I just talked to them uh, this week, uh, one gave me the example of, um, of a U.S. drug enforcement uh, agent <clears throat> calling the military, and not just the military, but also the Marines who have built a very close relationship with their, with their American counterparts. And they said, uh, you know, there we have an operation ongoing in, in the state of Guerrero, um, gave them a lot of the information, and the response from the Mexicans was uh, not no, uh, Pero veremos uh, lo que pasa es que you know that, that kind of stuff. So I said there's a there's a there's a real change that's that's taken place and that has people worry. Um, as one agent told me, a former agent told me, the climate of uncertainty is eroding the cooperation that we have worked very hard with Mexico to build for so many years, <clears throat> and that will affect our own national security. Um, I hope that the talk of ripping off uh, ripping NAFTA apart. Building a wall is just a game, words, because otherwise the cooperation will be minimal, inconsequential, and superficial. While lateral cooperation working together will keep us more secure than building a wall. Finally, residents in Ciudad Juarez and other regions in Mexico 
are worried about the extradition of Chapo Guzman because what happens if there is a plea bargain? As we, as we saw with the uh, case of Ociel Cárdenas, um, once Ociel did the plea bargain, you saw massive uh, homicides throughout uh, Tamaulipas, Coahuila, and other regions. There were, there were unintended consequences. So I think people are, are, are bracing uh, for some tough, tough months ahead, not just in Juarez, but in other parts of the country. Thank you. Thank you, and again, thank you, Eric. Um, thank you very much. Um, Duncan, Chris, um, the Mexico Institute, Andrea, and Amanda. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Tamaulipas, which has been um, a state that, that has been very violent in the past seven years, but all these dynamics that we're talking about and that uh, David mentioned, and the recent increase of violence, Tamaulipas has uh, recently experienced a different pattern, uh, a reduction in the levels of violence and a transition to a democratic state very recently. But this seems, this seems to me, or this would seem something very positive. However, uh, my conclusions would probably not be so positive because what we have um, tried to understand, what David mentioned, what are the strategies that, that need to be put together to reduce violence, maybe are not the ones that have uh, taken place in Tamaulipas that have achieved the results that we now can observe. However, uh, after, after that being said, Tamaulipas can give us a lot of surprises. Tamaulipas was a forgotten border for several decades, a place for smuggling, for drug trafficking, uh, since that is the time of the prohibition, because of its um, of its uh, of its location, it's uh, strategically located in uh, in the Mexican territory. It has border and it has Gulf coasts. So the drugs can come from the south, the arms can come from the north, and drugs can go uh, to to Europe as well. The, the Gulf and the border <coughs> are very important. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a strategic location. Therefore, for many times, and this is why I always call the forgotten border, nobody really uh, put attention on this part of the border. It's the, uh, on the other side, uh, the United States part of the Texas border is the poorest part of the US-Mexico border, the poorest part of the United States. Um, and so nobody really Play, uh, no, no, nobody paid attention to what was happening there. So smuggling of, um, of b before it was um, a land for smugglers, smuggling of whiskey and electrodomestics, and when the routes of trafficking changed, the, the smuggling of, of cocaine basically crossed through here. And nobody really uh, paid attention uh, as, as, as it has been this, this is time. Uh, this is the, um, the state of the Mexico-U.S. border with more international crossings, 19 in total. And that also tells us how important this is a place for smuggling because it has a connection to, uh, to main highways in the United States. And, and it's very important that um, this, is, this is very important for smugglers and for traffickers of all kinds. Uh, why the, the border stopped to be forgotten? Because the Zetas, this organization at some point was controlling, I mean, this, this regional cartel that was controlling half of the country, the Gulf Coast, and some parts of Central America, was, I mean, they, they started to, to um, uh, they, they started as an as, um, arm wing of the, um, of the Gulf cartel that had operated and had consolidated drug trafficking in Tamaulipas, and this man, Osiel Carenas Guillén, was the one who brought the Zetas as their arm wing, and the arm wing, uh, when he was extradited to the United States, uh, expanded, and I eventually, in the year of 2010, the, the, the work that they have been doing, the, the company, first it was the Gulf Cartel, then there was a compañía, the company, because the Zetas expanded, they were working together, not separate. Uh, I mean, not they. They, they were not. Wor they were working together, but they, to some extent, the Zetas got some independence. And in the year 2010, the Zetas decided to to declare a war against the Gulf Cartel, and there was a, a very violent wo uh, war that cost several lives, not only in Tamaulipas, but the power and this war expanded 
to, Vera, uh, to Veracruz, to uh, I mean to the to the to the Gulf, uh, all, all the Gulf Coast, uh, Coahuila, Nuevo León. This this conflict that um, that that we remember the bodies, this model of organized crime, uh, this consolidation, this this different type of of. Um, of, of organized crime that born, was born with the Zetas, but in conjunction with a war against the, the one's allies, uh, put our country in, in, a, in, in a very complicated uh, position. And first, we had this fight in the, in the beginning of 2010, and the armed forces, after the declaration of war of Felipe Calderon, and what was happening in Tamaulipas, we had um, a second uh, level of violence uh, before, uh, in, in the beginning, it was just a plight, a very violent plight between two groups that were militarized. The militarization of organized crime arrived uh, at its, its highest uh, level, at its highest um, form with, with the creation of the Zetas. And the response by the Mexican federal forces increased the levels of violence to levels that probably we had never seen uh, at that point in the country. Uh, the, the San Fernando massacre in, in, the, in August of 2010, 72 migrants that were killed, that were killed at the same time. The next year in April, 200 bodies buried and, and the kidnapping of, of uh, a number of bosses, um, different um, uh, shootings in different parts of the city. I remember in the year 2010, at the end of, uh, I mean, in, in, the, in the end of 2010, there, was, there were shootings in the city of Matamoros that lasted for almost a whole day. It was, it was, it was a situation where every, everybody who wanted to, uh, uh, to initiate a business or that had a business, a small business owners and, and uh, most of the of the regular people had to pay peso. The number of kidnappings raised, and and that that was maintained. That that really made this part of the border stop being forgotten, and we uh, it attracted attention of of the media and and at the at the national level. However, the real things that were taking place in Tamaulipas were not covered by the media, so it was very difficult to know and to understand with the detail that we know what happened in in in, um, in Ciudad Juarez what happened in Tijuana. In Tamaulipas, the, the, the media was, was silenced because it was always controlled by these powerful um, criminal organizations that operated silently, but that, consolidated, that were able to control the society, the politics, and the economy of, this, of the state. Um, this changed it all. And after the federal forces arrived and generated even more violence, uh, these this, this, this regional cartels started, with the participation of the federal forces, started to fragment. And we started to see different types, di di different uh, levels of violence after the arrest of the main leaders of the Zetas and the Gulf Cartel. And now we lost track of, of who's who, who's, who's leading these organizations, these, these, uh, these factions, these, these, uh, these new cells um, of these previous um, of these previous cartels. This is like a, an explanation that I'm not going to go ve in, into detail, but this is an explanation that's not presented in the media, but after following it, after following the social media, and, and, and doing like a, um, a work that I have been doing for these past seven years of uh, talking to, to people about what has been happening since, uh, I mean, since the, the, since the end of, since the beginning of, of this century that really changed the whole uh, face of what was happening in Tamaulipas and, you know, the, the different leaderships. But today, we cannot talk about leaderships. We, we talk about cells. And this fragmentation has, uh, has caused something that, that we didn't expect, which is a reduction in the levels of violence. And this is what I would like to focus more on. Um, Unfortunately, this, 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 uh, and the, the homicides in Tamaulipas show the same trend that, that was shown in, in, um, in Ciudad Juarez or in, in, or in Tijuana. But in the year 2016, levels of violence and homicides started to decrease. And my expectation, I, mean, I, I, I expect that my, my forecast is in the year 2017, the levels of violence will go down even more. If you remember, in June 25th of 2016, Tamaulipas had an election. 
in the year 2010, Hamaulipas had an election, and some days before the election, the candidate who was going to win, the PRI candidate, was killed. And this was also unprecedented. This, this, this assassination uh, like made everybody very uh, nervous, and this time, things changed. The, the election took place in a relatively stable um, um, in a stable situation, there was not much violence, and for the first time in several decades, uh, uh, more than 80, uh, 80 years, the party in, po uh, in power, the PRI, lost the election of the governorship. And today, we have a different um, governor, Francisco Javier Cabeza de Vaca of the National Action Party. At that time, and it was, it was, it's not, it's not, um, it's not that the violence re was reduced because of the of the very recent policies that I don't know exactly what what are the what are the plans. We don't know exactly what are the plans with regards to security of Francisco Javier Cabeza de Vaca. But this re this, this this trend, this reduction in the levels of violence, in the intensity of the violence, we still observe, and and this this is something that uh, that I would like to, to point out. This is the way how Tamaulipas. How we can how we can see the the intensity of violence in Tamaulipas in the past two three years the the Gulf and the border violence has been concentrated in the Gulf and the border and in the in, in Ciudad Victoria Ciudad Victoria Tampico like the border with uh, with Veracruz uh, Matamoros Reynosa Nuevo Laredo the most important cities are the ones that have experienced uh, highest levels of violence today we still see. Uh, we, we, we still see confrontations, but mostly in Nuevo Laredo and in Ciudad Victoria. In Reynosa, we see a, a complicated situation because the enforcement of the U.S. side of the border has, has also had an impact in the different activities of the different cells in the in in the state. We cannot talk about these this, this regional cartels that uh, at some point just traffic drugs at another point, diversified their activities but controlled territories that were very, very extensive. Now we're talking about cells that control activities. This is what's happening now. So the cells are uh, right now, there's like, uh, and, I can, and I can talk about uh, Pax Mafiosa, because these this, this, uh, this cartels, uh, the, the new governor, it's not saying anything, does not seem to have a comprehensive security plan, or at least a security plan that we know it till today. However, in, in a very interesting way, from October 2016, we have not heard of something extremely, uh, some, something extreme. Uh, one politician, well, does he say, well, that there was an accident, but... Um, uh, but uh, but there's nothing that that has been claimed by these uh, by these cells that they they perpetrated something political or something or something massive. So what we know is that uh, the theft of hydro of of fuel still is very important in the state. The the plaza of of Reynosa, uh, uh, they sell gasoline everywhere. The same thing in in um, in Matamoros, in Tampico. Uh, the uh, kidnappings continue, but not to the extent they they they, they were uh, at that time. At you know, in in in, uh, in the past two years, uh, Nuevo Laredo. We don't listen a lot about what happens in Nuevo Laredo, but we know that the smuggling of people, the sm uh, people smuggling in Reynosa, in, in in Nuevo Laredo, it's is very very important. There's a lot of deportations, and therefore uh, the the groups that cells that operate in the in the two in the two places are. Uh, uh, um, it's it's um, it's it's a very important business. Less drug trafficking or the drug trafficking groups uh, have their spaces, and these other cells are dedicating themselves and are specializing in different activities: smuggling of people. In the case of Nuevo Laredo, the cells, the, the Zeta cells uh, that um, that that usually that that operated um, that operated as a group are now dedicating themselves to to smuggle people. In the case of Nuevo Laredo, in the case of Reynosa, the Gulf Cartel is smuggling people, less drugs. The enforcement on the U.S. side. If you go to the U.S. side, to the other the other part of Miguel Alemán, um, Miguel Alemán, Díaz Ordaz, La Región Ribereña, and Reynosa, you see um, state troopers every 
probably two miles and you see uh, a lot of enforcement, therefore they have changed their activities, but still the smuggling networks are very strong and you cannot pass to the other side without, without paying to, to, to the cartels. So um, we, have, we have seen also in, in, in cities that are very important like Nuevo Laredo or Matamoros, we see a reduction in the levels of violence and the people talking about a better, co uh, a good coordination between the federal forces and state authorities. And this coordination is not new. This coordination was, uh, was part of the last part of the, of the past uh, governorship. Um, people, uh, people consider that it has, been, it has been appropriate, the participation of the federal forces, of the military. The military uh, elements have, re have been reduced and at the same time, the levels of violence have been reduced, which means that something is happening, but then there's no institution building. The police at the local level has not been reintegrated. So we just have federal forces, state authorities, less number of, 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 uh, of, of members of the army and the Marines, but a Pax Mafiosa, and we don't know what can happen. Um, we, don't, we don't see that the, that the governor is, is implementing any plan, or, or trying to see what happened in the previous administration, only previous administrations, and, and this is probably worrisome. There's no institutional building, redu the reduction of the levels of violence, and still organized crime dominates the activities in the state of Tamaulipas. Thank you, and well, I, I just wanted to tell you that, I mean, about the, if, if somebody is interested in, 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 in knowing who's who in, 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 in Tamaulipas, we have, as I, I, I don't want to, to talk about the names of the groups. I'm talking about, for example, the CD, the CDG Matamoros group that operates in Matamoros, by Hermoso, and San Fernando, and dominates the activities in that region. Uh, members of the, go uh, cartel, the, the Gulf Cartel in Reynosa, and they operate in the Rio Bravo, Reynosa, and Re La Ribereña, which is the small border. We have the Cartel del Golfo Tampico. They are operating uh, independently, as I said. And we have the, the, the main points of violence right now. It's, the, it's the, the city of Ciudad Victoria. El Cartel del Noreste is operating and has been operating um, in, in Nuevo Laredo and in Coahuila. They have been the people of, of um, uh, Miguel Angel Treviño Morales. La Zetas Vieja Escuela, they are operating in, in, um, in Victoria. And this is where, where, where we have some problems because Cartel del Noreste wants to, to take control of, of um, of, of um, Ciudad Victoria, which is the capital city, and this is where, where we have some issues. But this happened in Matamoros, this happened in Reynosa, and now the cities are, are less, less, uh, with, with, with less violence. And some people talk about other groups that, are with that, 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 uh, that help uh, some one, one, of, one of each. Um, what, uh, what is interesting is, for example, Coahuila, that in the past, uh, the, like the past two years, um, reach very high levels of violence. Today, uh, the Cartel del Noreste is, 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 is less, I mean, it's not so, uh, it's more silent, but still continues operating. And um, well, no, that's, that's, that's how it is, the panorama of the cartel factions in Tamaulipas. Hello. I've, it's become formulaic to thank Duncan and Eric. I'll continue the formula. Thank you. But I, I want to thank the Wilson Center and for all of you who are coming and mm -hmm. do something different and thank the panelists. I, I know the work that you all are doing uh, from experience mm -hmm. is incredibly difficult work to do. It wears on you. I know David's been doing this longer than I have maybe. And, and uh, used to have a full head of hair. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, um, there's a whole lot of human misery that, that, and thank you all for coming and caring about this uh, issue as well. So, um, uh, and Andrea, thank you. <laughs> I do have a PowerPoint thing. I wanna keep my comments as short as I can. I'm not really that organized today. Um, uh, let's see if we, Okay, uh, I do. Um, there's, um, uh, it should be labeled Wilson something or another.
There he is. I, I made my background Spartan. I'm so tired of the images of all this that I just, um, the, uh, yeah. Okay, I, I have been tracking killings. I, I do this differently from the way everybody else up here on the stage, I think, is doing it, with possible exception of America. But I, I start with reports of killings and build uh, a database from the ground up, and then I look at the end of the month at what the government is reporting. And, and uh, But uh, for each of those points, I, I've got almost a decade's worth I'm missing a couple of years and a couple of months here and there, but I've got about 15,000 homicides in a GIS database. For each of those killings, I've got some degree of detail about what, what's happened, and that's, that's a, uh, my database at the moment. So that's, that's the evidentiary underpinnings of what I'm going to say today. Um, I, I want to just look kind of at the trend that I see in 2016. I don't have the insights that these others have about the organizations that are responsible. One of the things that I've seen is that, that there seems to be less reward for naming your organization and taking credit for it. And so things are becoming, there's a lot more, as we'll see, communication going on, but it's going on in the background between people. It's not aimed at the general audience of the way that, that so it's, a, uh, for me, getting more difficult to track exactly who is doing this and why. Uh, but I, we can see from looking at the pattern of what they're doing, why, but, but not from uh, direct evidence. It's kind of indirect. Uh, this is 2015. I just want to show the, the uh, the pattern of homicides in 2015, and here's 2016. Uh, I'm missing a couple of months in 2016, so there would have been more dots, but I think that the overall geographic pattern I is more or less the same. Um, yeah. Uh, the, they're really, uh, if you look at the balance of where killings are happening, it's statistically it's almost exactly, if you divide the state into regions, it looks the same in 2016 as it did in 2015. There are slight changes in the Costa Grande uh, down in this area was worse in 2015 and, and over here Zihuatanejo uh, was comparatively calm in 2015 and in 2016 had a, a real, so in, in the Costa Grande the violence has kind of shifted to the west a little bit. Uh, but the Costa Grande as a whole uh, represents the same proportion of homicides as it did the, the year before. Now that's about the most dramatic shift. There's been a little bit of an increase in Costa Chica in, in killings. Um, I think a little bit of a reduction in violence in the Iguala area in the north, uh, but, but overall uh, I, I don't see any real change in the pattern. Uh, uh, just as a, um, a bit of background context, the, 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 I'm not sure how significant this is in terms of what's going on, but uh, there, there was, 2016 did witness the assumption to power of a new governor, a new fiscal, um, and a whole lot of municipal presidents uh, out of the 81 uh, municipalities in, in the state, uh, half of them or more uh, had new alcaldes uh, in 2016. And we did see some violence related to, uh, to the changes in administration as old people were purged and new people, uh, lessons had to be taught and so on and so forth. And, uh, but I, I don't think statistically that, that uh, had that big of an impact on the overall levels of violence. Uh, here's the, kind of not, not the greatest graphic, but it, uh, there are two counts of bodies in uh, that I, I have just dismissed the Anahis because the root. But the, the SNSP, the government uh, numbers, coming out of the Ministerio Publico uh, office. Uh, th and these are reported or open homicide investigations that are r reported monthly. I, I think these numbers are, are accurate in, in Get It or I don't think there's significant under-reporting 
uh, of it. I do the, the, the difference between my numbers, this GVP is a get at or a violence project, that's what I do. Um, my numbers are consistently higher. I'm getting about 20% more than they are. But I think the difference is that what they're reporting are open homicide investigations, and I'm counting bodies. Uh, uh, Multi-casualty incidents go down as a single case in their numbers, and, uh, and my body count is higher because I'm, I'm counting individual bodies. So, but we're, we're tracking the same trends, and it's, it's uh, consistent from one to the next. And so uh, they, they, I actually show a slightly lower rate of growth between 2015 and 2016 than they do. They have a 10% increase in, in killings. I have a 7% increase in killings. But, um, um, I think yeah, here are the totals over here. This is the, depending on which count, this is the average daily number of killings. You can see they're 5.5 uh, to 6 or 6 to 7 uh, or 6.5 to 7, depending on w which data source you uh, look at. This, I guess I want to say this, I, I don't, not sure what to make of this. Since 2012, Guerrero has had the highest per capita homicide rate in, in Mexico. Uh, but in 2016, we were actually overtaken for the first time by Colima. Colima has not been represented here in, on this panel, but ought to be, because there's something bad's happening in Colima. Um, I, I as, as someone with connections in Guerrero, I kind of, I, I would take, take see this as an optimistic trend, except the numbers in Guerrero are higher, too. It just means that Colima's got astronomical, and, and it's, it's not that things are better in Guerrero, it's just Colima deteriorated very sharply. Um, uh, wait. I'm missing a slide. Uh, here we go. Uh, I, as I looked at the numbers, the biggest change that I could see was in the pattern of killings. We do seem to have fewer bodies appearing in clandestine graveyards. And, and what this indicates is that, that there is a reduction in, in, in kidnapping large scale. The, the drivers of violence in Gadetero are, are three to fourfold. Uh, there's <coughs> drug production and competition over opium fields. And this, this creates sporadic uh, areas in, on the edges of territory controlled by separate uh, groups. Uh, in in the, the core areas controlled by a particular group, there's almost no violence at all. They, they protect those areas. And, and, but along the frontiers, there, there can be violence. So th that's, that's how opium, you, you would ask about how opium drives violence. Um, uh, uh, the next thing is is uh, control over contraband markets in urban centers, control over retail drug um, weapons. Uh, we don't have much data on weapons trafficking, but but control over contraband markets. Um, and then a third one would be extortion, and, and I think this one's the one that's killing, er, leading to the highest body count is extortion. Operations and then kidnapping. Uh, kidnapping ideally doesn't lead to a death, but uh, a lot of people die in the course of, of large-scale kidnapping operations. Uh, the mo the most famous of them were outside of Iguala uh, after the Ayotzinapa affair. There were systematic explorations of of the the surrounding barrios out outside of Iguala, and a lot of mass graves uh, and clandestine graves popped up. Uh, w but we also had similar things I around in Chopancingo and in Acapulco, and we're not getting those anymore. Um, I, it looks like in those major cities, these big kidnapping operations have wound down. Where we're getting clandestine graveyards now are in Chilapa, secondary cities. Uh, San, San Miguel Totolapan has not yet produced them, but the kidnapping, the evidence of widespread kidnapping activity is high, and so I would anticipate eventually soon we will start to, to uh, excavate as soon as it's safe enough to go looking and it isn't at the moment but in San Miguel Totolapan and Ahuchitlan 
we'll, we'll start to find some new areas. But I think overall, these are smaller areas and the kidnapping operations are smaller in scale and generating fewer bodies. So I think that there's been less of that. Well, what, uh, there, the numbers, as a percentage of all homicides, it fell from 8% of the bodies buried or excavated from graves to, to 5%. Uh, where we're really seeing an increase is in this this exhibitionist type of killings. Uh, the, these are killings that have mensajes that involve dismemberment. That are there's a, a conspicuous effort to communicate to use a human body as a communicative device, and and the the the, the typical form is dismemberment, but it it can happen in the staging of the body or a lot of different, different. and we're really seeing an increase in that uh, the, in 2016 over 2015. Um, we're uh, just I'm not sure how you want to, just all forms of exhibitionism, uh, you know, by my count, um, went from 180 to 339. Uh, dismembered bodies uh, up to 178, that, that's one of the highest annual rates that we've got, even in the heyday. Uh, and my homicide numbers are higher for 2016 than ever. Um, the SNSP has 2011, 2012 as slightly higher than than uh, 2016. So it depends on who you count. But but even at the heyday, I I, I didn't go back uh, to look at the number of dismemberments I got in 2012. So, but these are high numbers. This this um, it went f as a percentage of all homicides. This exhibitionism thing went from 3.3 to to almost 7% of them. Uh, it, it, it indicates real active competition in the urban areas uh, f uh, for control over these contraband markets and extortion uh, neighborhoods and extortion. I think that's what's uh, driving. These are messages that are being sent from one group to the next and, and um, the, uh, uh, as to what can be done about it, I, I don't see any. The, at the beginning of the year, the new governor, the new fiscal were optimistic about Mondo Unico. That I, By mid-year, that discussion had disappeared, and I haven't heard much about Mondo Unico all, uh, you know, since March or so of last year. Uh, uh, a unified command in a, uh, of, of the state and federal. Let's get to that in the question and answer thing. I just want to say one more thing and move to the question and answer. Um, the only thing I've heard about, the, the only new suggestion I've heard about, and this is just in the form of mumblings about you know, once a week or once a month or so out of the fiscal or the governor, is legalization of, of opium production in the countryside. As though the, but, but really there, there are no uh, s solutions being even talked about in the state of Guerrero at the moment. There's, there's, as Guadalupe was saying, there's no comprehensive security strategy that I can see. Um, I, I don't I look at, hear from David more about uh, how the, the judicial reform process is working out, but I just don't see anything happening that is um, good. I'm going to go ahead and stop at this point and open this up for questions. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Kyle. It was great, and Guadalupe, thank you so much um, to all of you all for all of your insight. Um, I'm going to maybe ask uh, two general questions and then open it up and take questions maybe in groups of like three at a time. If you um, want to direct it to a particular person, that's fine, or if you want to just have it to the panel. Um, one of my questions is, as you sort of started to get at it, but are there any, um, I, I guess when you were talking about Tijuana, you mentioned a lot of local strategies that a police chief was able to do to make a difference. Um, and some of that was in Juarez too, and the same police chief came to Juarez. And I wonder, um, are there any federal or, or, or state policies that you hear talked about right now? There's debate over the internal security law, which would you know, regulate the military, or, or should they be withdrawn from public security, or the, the, this idea that the state police could um, you know, subsume a lot of the municipal police that's been around forever but hasn't gone forward. Are there any like parts of, the, of policies that you think could make a difference, or does it seem like a, this is all criminal dynamics that are going um, to determine the, the levels of violence? And the second question is, um, if there were to be more, in, uh, more deportations from the United States 
to the border cities, how do you think that would impact the, um, the, you know, the, cr the, cr the criminal dynamics where, where you're covering? Thank you. And whoever wants to go. David. Well, on the, just on the policy measures, I mean, the, uh, one of the things the Peninato administration has uh, talked about, I haven't followed how well they, or to what extent they've implemented it, is uh, an effort to deploy uh, an increased number of, of uh, federal uh, troops, or f federal forces, to uh, some of the top most uh, violent cities uh, throughout the country. And th that can have a short-term uh, effect of, of tamping down the violence in some of those places. At least we've seen that in the past. Uh, uh, again, I think what is really needed is more of a localized strategy. This is why I oppose the idea of a mando unico at, at a national, certainly, and uh, even state level, because um, what you really need is to have police actively engaging in a preventative way in the communities that are most affected by violence. And given that we know a lot about which communities seem to generate the, the most violence, uh, that's where I would direct those efforts. We even know a lot about the uh, individual networks. Uh, if you take the individual homicides, uh, that uh, the kind that uh, Chris is uh, looking at, and you look at the social network of the individual who was killed, you're going to find the next victim. And so uh, the kind of uh, in, uh, intervention strategies need to be very micro level mm -hmm. uh, and uh, whether they are government intervention uh, efforts or uh, non-governmental intervention mm -hmm. efforts, gang prevention programs and the like, uh, they really need to be looking at those kinds of, of uh, factors. On the deportation question, uh, Mass deportations are something that, uh, especially in border communities, uh, mayors and police chiefs have been really struggling with. Uh, it is a public safety problem in two ways. One, to the extent that we are actually, uh, or have actually been deporting criminal aliens as priority candidates for, for deportation. We are sending dangerous people into border communities. Uh, but to the extent that we are also sending back uh, non-criminal elements uh, to uh, and, and just pushing them off to the other side of the border, we are creating a huge potential victim population. Uh, so it is a, uh, a bad strategy. It would certainly be worse if we suddenly threw everyone into boxcars uh, and took them down to the border and, uh, and, uh, and dumped them off. I think uh, the, the consequences of a uh, mass deportation strategy uh, uh, would be disastrous in, in terms of the human effects of that. I mean, I, I think you hear the same thing in, in Ciudad Juarez, that uh, what's really work is, has been at the community level, and people are much more concerned about the presence, the increased presence of federal troops or, or federal agents. Uh, uh, they, they harp back on, on the whole point of building trust, building community trust. Uh, and I think, I mean, there's been a lot of that uh, over the last, I would say, last five, seven years, mm -hmm. where they, they continue to do this. Uh, there's the, the, the real concern is, is the whole continuity problem. You know, every three years, every six years, you have <laughs> entirely different police force, and so you have to start from scratch. Um, if, if, if I may, I mean, if, if I can just underscore uh, a point that uh, Guadalupe made about Tamaulipas, uh, when she was talking about... Uh, it's still kind of a state without institutions, uh, still very much governed by, by the cartels. I mean, we, we've seen that in Juarez, and certainly we see that in, in Tamaulipas now, where because things are quiet, it doesn't mean that it's over. Uh, this week, um, uh, El, El Mañana newspaper was on the verge of shutting down because four of their distributors were, had been... Uh, uh, beaten up, one was left for dead, uh, their vehicles were burned, and it came after uh, El Mañana began to again publish numbers of people mm -hmm. killed. And that kind of gives you a sense of, of where the control continues, you know, that there's still very much a cartel, uh, la, la, la Vieja Guardia and... La Vieja Escuela. La Vieja Escuela and, and, and Noroeste. Uh, and it's a lesson that, that you've seen from Juarez. I mean, it, during that period, things were kind of quiet, mm -hmm. but suddenly, bam, you know, it just, it just explodes again. 
and because the institutions are not there. And I think that's what community uh, groups will tell you is that we have to continue building uh, institutions. We have to build in, uh, rule of law, and it's, it's just not there yet. Um, sorry. No. Oh, just, just to, to complete this idea, um, I agree totally with, with Alfredo. Um, I'm I'm pretty worried about Tamaulipas because of that. When 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 the when the two main criminal organizations in Tamaulipas decided to have a war, we had a war. The response I I I elevated the the war. We don't have police, um, and there was another 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 time after after Plan Tamaulipas, we had um, we had federal forces. We don't have police, so regular crime um, went up. But when they decide, when they decide, and it's it's very worrisome how somebody described me in Matamoros, for example, the leadership in Matamoros, the leader in Matamoros said, no, no kidnappings, no piso, we have to con we have to grow, and he's doing that right now with the new mayor. Uh, the, the new mayor arrived, and the problems are, are are not seen, but they are still operating there. Um, it's it's uh, I mean, what happened in El Mañana is just a sign of, okay, you don't do that, and maybe they are not going to, they are, con they are con going to continue sil uh, silence, and we're going to continue looking at the levels of violence uh, down. I'm very worried about the situation because we don't have local police, and there doesn't seem to be a plan at the federal level to, uh, and at the state level, to, to generate the police again, uh, I mean, the, the 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 local police there, there's no there's no real collaboration and another thing citizen security in Tamaulipas is very difficult organized crime is militarized and of course we have the federal forces so for civil society to participate as they participate in in Tijuana or in Ciudad Juarez is very complicated the media cannot even report anything so Claire just a just a quick comment on the federal versus local initiatives and echoing some of what my, my colleagues here have said. Uh, I, I, I do favor more the idea of the bottom-up approach instead of the top-down uh, approach, meaning the federal uh, c taking control of, of local security uh, or even state, uh, state governments taking control of, of uh, city-level security. Um, one of the uh, experiences that uh, we've had uh, going to uh, Juarez in 2011 and, and uh, probably the most violent year in the city and also going to Tijuana is that when uh, the federal forces arrive, uh, they, they tend to displace local police and local police tend to resent that. They feel not part of the, of the strategy, but what happens with when they go because the feds are not gonna stay forever so, you know, they come, they uh, y usually uh, what happened with operations like Operacion uh, Michoacán and Michoacán, uh, Plan Tamaulipas, Todos Somos Juárez, or Tijuana Segura, like all those uh, federal plans, uh, operations come, violence drops down suddenly and then goes up again very, 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 uh, very fast. So it's, it's not stable and then, you know, Apparently, things uh, get stable. What happened? Uh, usually, uh, those operations ten tend to crack down bigger organizations and create much smaller uh, groups that are less predictable. Uh, but then, but then the federal forces leave, and if there's not a, an effort to build uh, solid institutions at the local level, then it's going to be hard. Uh, um, to to really get to the problem, uh, I just want to say, like, it, it seems like I favor uh, some of Leisa Ola's policies in Tijuana or in Juarez. It, it's not like that. I mean, there are serious allegations of human uh, of human vi uh, human rights violations. But what he did, and and that might be uh, a good uh, a good lesson, is to make a much more uh, solid and strong institution at the local level, police, and. Um, so that, that may be a good, a good uh, approach. And also uh, the civil society has helped a lot in some of the cities to, to really uh, create uh, solid networks at, 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 the, at the bottom, at the local level. Uh, uh, just in terms of 
local level things. I, two years ago, I came here and wrote, wrote a paper, and I was quite optimistic in that paper and in my presentation about the, the possibilities of, of community policing networks to, to really help, because these things are things that grew out of the communities that have, I mean, one of the problems with the federal police coming in, they're considered tourists in the communities that they work in. They, they, everybody knows they're going to leave, and, and so nobody's going to report who the bad guys are to them because as soon as they leave, there's no protection there. And, and community policing networks can get around that problem because these are stable. These are things that grow out of the community and you know who to go to and they're not going to go anywhere. And, 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 uh, but, uh, and in 2014 was the explosion or the year that there was just a, a real proliferation of these community policing networks in Guerrero and Michoacan and other areas. And, 2015, uh, one of the trends that I didn't mention uh, is uh, th there were fewer balaceras in 2016, fewer shootouts, kind of fixed position engagements between either military and drug trafficking organizations. Or, but in 2015, actually most people who died in balaceras were community police fighting other community mm. police, <coughs> factions uh, with, with in the state of Guerrero. So 2016 actually had a reduction in balacera killings uh, because of that. The military has also really learned, uh, I think I had two soldiers killed both off duty in 2016. The, uh, they've stayed out of it. I mean, the, the numbers of law enforcement officials who have died in Guerrero, as those numbers have gone up, the numbers of police, military, and whatnot have gone down. And they're, they're really, uh, uh, oh, uh, um, but the, uh, I, I think, I mean, it, it, it's true that we need uh, local things, but it's got to be supported by state, and there's got to be facilitation of communication between authorities, state authorities, and these community policing groups civil organizations, victims' rights, advocates, human rights groups need to be brought into the conversation. And, and, the, and I think that the only way those conversations can be facilitated is with the commitment of state and federal authorities and stuff. So it's, it's not that the state and federal government doesn't have a role, they do, but it's not just saturating an area temporarily with, with, with the police. And, uh, and the other thing is just keep plucking away at judicial reform. Yeah. I mean, that, that one of the problems is that everybody wants a solution now, a and these are long-term problems that have to be, that are going to take a long time to solve, and, and, and it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be cheap. Yeah, and, but anyway. um, just one last question, I guess, more for David and, and Octavio. Um, as a lot of people have told me that it's really important um, that the transition that's going on be from the attorney general to a more independent, um, I don't ever know, fiscal. the fiscal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you see that and then, you know, it's kind of like all, all the news on the judicial transition process, there was a lot of political will put in and money and funding when you had the technical secretariat to implement it. But sort of can you tie in your work that you do on judicial reform and the transition to the – Scott, like you've seen all these governors. I mean, the, the corruption is not just local, right? It's it's a lot of outgoing governors in 2016 are investigated here and in Mexico. Some are ones at least one still on the run, right? And so, um, what if you were able to have because DOJ works really closely with Mexican Attorney General in certain cases. What if, what if there was like you know some sort of case that was emblematic that they were able to actually solve and prosecute in Mexico of a former governor? Would that put someone on notice? Maybe that's going to be coming in as a mayor or governor, or how, how can you support people who are taking <laughs> office now who maybe haven't had a history of corruption because they never governed a state, you know? Um, but how could the how can how can there be the right incentives, right, that somebody won't um, be tempted to kind of become corrupt because that's the only way they can stay alive and where they are? I mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, as Chris mentions and as, as your comment uh, and question mentioned, um, addressing the, the deficits in judicial sector capability and integrity are the probably the, the biggest challenges that we face. Um, as we can see, violence goes up and down, um, and it's, it's largely driven by the dynamics of, of, of organized crime and uh, the socioeconomic uh, challenges that Mexico faces. But 
uh, at the end of the day, the, the strengthening of Mexico's state capacity uh, is, is essential to getting the situation under control. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, Mexico made a major transition, uh, six, 17 years ago, I guess, uh, to a, uh, new a, a new era of political alternation, and with that came uh, transparency. Right. We had a transparency law in uh, 2001, and uh, transparency is great. Transparency without accountability is not so great, because it's better almost to not know, <laughs> if you can't do anything about it, uh, that there is massive corruption and uh, that, there, uh, that, uh, that people are getting away with it. Uh, so how do we increase? The real question, as I see it uh, in, in your question, uh, is how do we increase accountability? in Mexico, um, whether that is at the individual level of criminal impunity or official impunity. And, you know, I think, as, as Chris said, it is a hard slog. It is, a, it is much easier to provide transparency than it is to provide accountability. And um, there are a number of me measures institutionally that I think are beginning to create uh, the mechanisms for accountability. Uh, in the next five years, uh, basically next year, we'll start to see uh, the first uh, uh, institution of re-election as, as an accountability mechanism in Mexico in over a hundred years, well, in, in almost a hundred years. Uh, and it is possible that your ability to vote someone in, back in or out of office will be a major motivator to create political will on the part of elected officials to behave better and to make sure that uh, government employees act with accountability. Um, I, I, with regard to a, an independent uh, fiscal, uh, I'm skeptical about this both because of the way that it's been handled, which uh, there are a lot of questions about uh, the, um, the uh, particular candidate that the Peña Nieto administration has in mind and, and how he was appointed. Uh, but I'm also skeptical because We've had independent uh, investigators, independent pro uh, counsel uh, in the United States um, in the 90s, for example, uh, pursue an unrelenting political agenda uh, to uh, go after poli a, a famous politician. I'm not going to name names, but we had a, an independent prosecutor in uh, the 1990s who went after uh, a famous politician and uh, wouldn't stop until you found the blue dress. So the, um, <laughs> the idea that an independent prosecutor is going to be any less politicized mm -hmm. uh, is not something I necessarily um, agree with. It'll be politicized possibly in different ways. And I think uh, uh, it, 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 the trajectory is already there. I think that's where Mexico is going. Uh, I think it may just create new, uh, new problems. Uh, but the bigger issue for judicial sector trend, uh, accountability is uh, what has happened in the last eight years in terms of the institution of this new criminal justice reform in Mexico and the number one aspect of accountability, well, there, there are multiple aspects of accountability that are now built in to the new uh, criminal justice model that uh, Mexico is using. Uh, one is that there are multiple judges overseeing a, a trial, and, and so uh, there are some checks and balances among judges themselves. Uh, there are actually three uh, judges who will uh, oversee a trial proceeding. So if you want to bribe the judge, you're going <laughs> to have to bribe at least two of them, uh, maybe all three. Um, but uh, the other aspect is, of course, because there is an adversarial process of a presentation and cross-examination of evidence, there are checks and balances built into uh, the process of, uh, of criminal proceedings. So uh, I think ultimately the way we get accountability is by creating those institutional checks uh, and systems. The one, and forgive me for going on and on, but the, the, the one area that I see a huge gap in Mexico are, is what are the accountability mechanisms to ensure police professionalism and integrity. Um, whether you have a, uh, a national police force, a state level uh, organized police force, or local police forces, if you do not have a, a, uh, a process of uh, police examinations that uh, ensures that people are promoted on the basis of merit, 
as opposed to internal politics or who knows who or who collects the most bribes. As long as you have a politics of, of personalism and uh, 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 amiguismo as the me method of professional advancement, you will not have um, professional police. And so I, I would ra ra I don't care how you organize your police force. I want to see that there are actual standards that people have to meet to get to the top of those organizations. And when that happens, when there's a sergeant's exam, a lieutenant's exam, and you're putting the best and brightest at the top, mm -hmm. they're not going to tolerate any of these other jokers that are uh, you know, asking for bribes, et cetera. So merit-based base criteria in police forces is the number one agenda for me for the next 10 years. Uh, and if you, do, if you could institute such a, a measure, uh, I think in 10 years we'd be looking at a much safer Mexico. I have a quick question for you, David. Um, uh, one of the problems we're going to run into really fast if Mexico does start developing an effective judiciary is security for the authorities themselves. Have we seen anywhere in the state an increase in violence directed at prosecutors, judges, or anything? Because I haven't seen it in Guerrero at all. I mean, and as long as we don't see that, I think it's a measure of just how inept or in in effective these these institutions are. You know, one of the signs I'm looking for of effectiveness is going to be violence directed at the institutions, and I just haven't seen it. Yeah. We have this year. We saw the first judge that I can recall uh, assassinated. It's really Mexico. sick that we would see this as a good sign, but that, that's the world we live in. It is. It is. But uh, you know, I, it, it wasn't necessarily because of the transition to uh, oral trials in this particular case. This was the judge that I think that was handling uh, the uh, Chapel case uh, uh, was shot. Um, interesting. What I want to ask is, are you seeing more motorcycles? Because I'm seeing more motorcycle. Uh, this, this judge, uh, two, two gunmen uh, came on motorcycles and uh, jumped off the motorcycles, went and killed the judge and then jumped on the motorcycles. Motorcycles are interesting. They used to come in in suburbans. Right? If you have suburb, if how, just thinking about this transition from suburbans to motorcycles, I think is fascinating. Because if if you can drive a suburban through town, and kill somebody, you've got the police at your back, right? But part of what's changed is, is you have more groups. They have to be able to get away quicker, because they don't necessarily have that kind of protection. So groups like uh, Nueva Generacion, they, uh, or the the New Generation Cartel of Jalisco. Uh, as I understand it, is relying more on motorcycles. So there's all kinds of interesting trends there. But sorry, this is a way, way away from <laughs> Yeah, this me, is a different uh, But judges are, I think judges are the next target. OK, l let me open up the to at least uh, three questions now. Um, go ahead. Jose Diaz with Reforma Newspaper. Uh, uh, my question is regarding extortion. Do you see different dynamics in every city you, you presented here? Is there less extortion in Tijuana and why than in the region in Tamaulipas or even Juarez? Is there another? Go ahead. <laughs> behind. Over here and then behind. Yeah. Uh, Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. Following the question about cities, if I were a young Mexican, relatively young Mexican, in a place that's threatened by the cartels and by violence, I'd want out and I'd try to settle somewhere else. M people are going north for that reason in large numbers, and they may be going north in smaller numbers because of recent policies. But they're also going out to other cities within the region and within Mexico. So what I'm wondering is if what has happened to those other cities? Is there safety in other cities? Other cities are growing. How are they coping with new arrivals? And are the cartels following them to, or the cartels, or rather the criminal gangs, not necessarily the drug cartels, but the criminal gangs following people to the new cities where they're trying to find safety? Thank you. Okay, maybe the one last, right behind her. Go ahead. Good evening. My, uh, good after. Good morning. My name is Gamal. Uh, my uh, f pers pers personally, I. Um, I would rather get killed than rather uh, become a drug addict and live my life dependent on drugs. On 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 on, on drugs. I'm surprised that uh, uh, that today's panel is focusing on violence without focusing on the the, so the 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 main the main reason of violence, with which is uh, the drug cartel, the drug dealers, and and it's especially here in the United States, we are legalizing who are legali legalizing drugs one state at a time. I wonder if, if, if you see any connection between legalizing, uh, legalizing uh, 
drugs here in the United States with the rise of violence because, because the more we legalize it and the, the, the more the Mexican will just fight over producing drugs and just and, and, uh, and also the second thing, the same thing about guns, the, the, the mafia, the, the way you make gun easy and, and the, more ma the, more, the more Mexican will just will have their guns, you know, and just kill each other. And, and, and also, there, there is, a, there is one, one tiny little question. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's a brainstorm. I think there is, I, I wonder if there is any relationship between the socialist uh, party in Mexico and the drug cartel. I, okay. I think, I, I okay. guessing, I think there is. Okay, maybe if you guys, uh, if one of you would like to respond to mm. indicate who you're, go ahead. Oh. I just um, would like to address a little bit the three questions. Uh, the question about um, the drug cartels, the legalization of drugs, I believe that this problem is more, more than about drugs, and this is linked to the extortion part. We were not talking about drugs only when we're talking about drug cartels. We're talking about criminal organizations that are diversifying and reach many levels, and we have talked about many levels here. So what about extortion? This, this new model that was, that was uh, I mean, that, that had been expanded to the whole country, the extortion part, the Codro de Derecho de Piso. What has happened um, in my region, for example? Extortion, extortion is, is part of, of the cash flow of these organizations. The extortion was higher in the, in the, during the first period because of the war between the cartels and the involvement of the federal forces. With Planta Maulipas, these, these groups needed to extort and kidnap to get the cash flow. Uh, as, I, as I told you um, earlier, um, but Matamoros, for example, the order by the current chief of Plaza, like no, no, no extortion as before. And people tell me, uh, one person told me, and now I can start uh, businesses without paying the extortion fee that before, any, anybody who wanted to initiate a, a, a business had to pay extortion fees. What I know, for example, in Dampico, that extortion, the extortion levels have gone down. In Reynosa, they're still very high. Uh, it depends on each of the municipality, and it's, uh, unfortunately, in the case of Tamaulipas, it depends on the leadership of these, um, of these cells that I, that I, that I talk about. And, and with regards to the young people, also we have to remember that we're, I mean, this time, Mexico is not the same Mexico that we were talking about during the Calderon administration, when all the efforts and all, all the efforts went, were, were put on security. Today, we're talking about a, a, a different reality, different uh, levels of violence, and, and violence going from the Gulf to the Pacific. And for example, these young people who left uh, cities like, like, like uh, Nuevo Leon or the cities of Coahuila or the cities in Tamaulipas, some of them have returned. And some of the people in Tamaulipas now can return to Monterrey. Many of them used to go to Monterrey, the people who have money. So um, I think that, that, um, that this, this type of uh, dynamics have, have changed. Uh, Mexico is not the same. I think you, you saw a lot of uh, uh, migration uh, throughout Mexico uh, internally. I mean, you saw a lot of people from Nuevo León, for example, leaving for San Miguel de Allende, El Bajío, Guanajuato, Querétaro, et cetera. Uh, and you also saw a lot of people fleeing for the United States. Uh, places like Dallas, uh, San Antonio, San, there's, a, there's a neighborhood in San Antonio called uh, Little Monterrey, Pequeño Monterrey. Um, and as far as extortions, and I was interested, uh, uh, last week I was in, in Tijuana, uh, last weekend, and before then I was in Ciudad Juarez, and already people are kind of, uh, uh, not just extortions, but uh, as Guadalupe was saying, you know, the, 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 the smugglers and so forth, I mean, all these little operations, uh, people planning uh, what the next price is if there is a wall, if, you know, if there is another wall, because, I mean, this, uh, we have to remind ourselves there is, there's already, a, a lot of fencing along the border, but any time you have uh, fencing, I mean, the prices go up. Uh, for example, the, the price from um, Nuevo Laredo to to Dallas or El Paso to Dallas, it's about six, seven thousand dollars, and and the talk is, you know, do do you double that now? Um, so so you see that. Uh, um, I mean, as I was saying earlier, the, the thing I've noticed about Ciudad Juarez and talking to cab drivers, talking to local people, is that they're accepting dollars. But I think that's the extortion, David. Uh, it's something that hap happens all along, all along Mexico. No, it's, it's just part of organized crime. 
Yeah, we're just looking at. And, and as far as uh, political parties, I I don't think there's any party that uh, that's not corruptible. I mean, whether it's the PRI, the PAN, the Socialists. I mean, you you've seen that. Uh, we we've seen that in, in throughout Mexico. We're just looking at the extortion figures for 2016, and there is significant variation. Uh, it, it's hard to track extortion on a per capita basis, so you can't, it, unlike uh, homicide cases, uh, we, well, these are not controlled per population is what I would say, and I'm not sure whether it would be appropriate to control extortion cases per 100,000. Uh, you're going to target areas that have maybe more uh, centers of uh, commerce uh, in extortion, et cetera. So, uh, but, but the point is there is definitely variation uh, in both the reporting and incidents of, of extortion. I think we tend to see less, for example, in Tijuana uh, than we might see in uh, some other places uh, like Michoacan. Uh, it really depends in, in many ways on the degree of fractionalization. Um, of organized crime, the more fractionalized your organization, the less you can rely on large-scale drug trafficking mm -hmm. operations as a way of financing your organization, and the more that you have to diversify into other uh, more, predato more predatory uh, uh, areas of crime. It's much, you know, there are very low startup costs to being a kidnapper. Uh, all you need is a cell phone, um, really. Uh, you can because you can do fake kidnappings. Uh, but if you have a knife, it helps, uh, and, and so on. But it's very, very low cost of entry. On the other hand, um, commercial activities for organized crime, like drug trafficking, uh, definitely require you to have some supply chain capability. Uh, it helps to you know, have a business degree. Uh, th there are lots of ways that um, uh, <coughs> the drug trafficking element is, is uh, distinctive from these predatory forms of organized crime. And even when we're talking about uh, things like the sale of uh, counterfeit fit goods, uh, if you're <laughs> moving uh, counterfeit CDs or DVDs or even other merchandise, uh, you're talking about stuff that was probably manufactured in China. You need, there's a whole supply chain element there as well. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the, on the question of extortion, I think we're really um, looking at uh, some variation that, that is uh, reflective of the kinds of organized crime structures we have. The other uh, uh, question about uh, population dislocation. We certainly saw that in Ciudad Juarez in 2010-11. We saw dispersion of uh, the population north of the border. We saw people uh, also uh, uh, leaving to other cities. Uh, there are various estimates, but we're talking about tens of thousands of people literally uh, fleeing areas of violence. Uh, we also, of course, have uh, uh, significant numbers of people uh, now applying for asylum uh, or Convention Against Torture uh, or withholding of removal proceedings uh, on the basis of violence in Mexico here in the United States. So it is a problem uh, that we have to consider. Um, on the, uh, the last point about drug, uh, uh, understanding the impact of drug use in the United States on organized crime in Mexico and violence, especially in Mexico, that is not lost on uh, anyone, I think, in this panel. Uh, and if it seemed like I underestimated that point or um, uh, diminished that point in any way, I, I hope uh, I can correct that by saying, you know, when we talk about organized crime, um, a major component of organized crime in, in Mexico uh, is drugs. And as I said in my uh, policy recommendations, one of the things that we could all do to make this problem go away is to reduce the uh, illicit market for drugs in the United States either by all stopping to uh, our drug use. Um, and again, remember, 50-plus percent of Americans not only favor marijuana legalization, 50% um, uh, uh, plus of uh, U.S. citizens have used drugs at some point in their lifetime. Uh, so there is, uh, there is something we could all do uh, in terms of limiting the market. Uh, but. Uh, I think the prevailing trend is that we have been legalizing marijuana, and that has had uh, a positive effect in reducing revenues of organized crime from marijuana uh, in Mexico. But the 
un unfortunate effect is that it leads them to diversify more. Uh, and it is why we have seen, in part, why we have seen a surge in heroin exports from Mexico to the United States. Uh, and it also affects, then, the dynamics of, of organized crime groups working uh, with heroin and also methamphetamine. So, uh, you know, drugs is a major component of this. It's the reason that the report we put out every year uh, focusing on this violence is still called drug violence in Mexico because so much of it uh, does relate to that phenomenon. Okay. Thank you so much to all of you. That's been a great panel. We have uh, another panel coming forward. So I'd like to just thank you guys for your questions and, um, and have a great day. Ten-minute coffee break. Ten-minute coffee break.